Chapter 16 of Humorous Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Humorous Ghost Stories, selected by Dorothy Scarborough. Chapter 16 The Ghost of Miser Brimson, Part 2. In truth, she made poor speed. Jonathan was always civil afterwards, but you might as soon have tried to thaw an iceberg with a box of matches as to get him round again by gentleness and affection. He was the sort that can't be won with kindness. He felt he treated the world better than the world had treated him, and the thought shriveled his heart a bit. Always shy and suspicious, you might say, and yet, underneath it, the most honorable and upright and high-minded man you could wish to meet. Hyssop loved him like her life, and she got a bit poorly in health after their sad quarrel. Then chance willed it that going down from Princeton to Plymouth by train to see a chemist and get something to make her eat, who should be in the selfsame carriage but Mr. Drake and his hind, Thomas Parsons. There was others there, too, and it fell out that an old fellow, as no Jonathan's grandfather before him, brought up the yarn about Miser Brimson, and asked young Drake if he took any stock in it. Of course the man pooh-poohed such foolery, and told the old chap not to talk nonsense like that in the ear of the nineteenth century. But when Jonathan and Parsons had got out of the train, which they did do at Yelverton Station, Hyssop, as knowed the old man, asked him to tell more about the miser. And he explained, so well as he knew how, that Brimson Drake had made untold thousands out of the French and American prisoners, and that without doubt was all hidden even to this day at Dunnerbridge. And of course Jonathan's too clever to believe such a tale like his father before him. But his grandfather believed it, and the old Blid spent half his time poking about the farm. Only, unfortunately, he didn't have no luck. But tis there for sure, and if Jonathan had enough faith, he'd come by it, not by digging and wasting time and labor, but by doing what is right and proper when you're dealing with such matters. And what might that be? asked Miss Burgess. Just then, however, the train for Plymouth ran up, and the old man told her that he'd explain some other time. This generation laughs at such things, he said, but they laugh best who laugh last. And for all we can say to the contrary, tis naught but his conceit and pride be standing between that stiff-necked youth and the wealth of a bank. Hyssop, she thought a lot upon this but she hadn't no need to go to the old chap again as she meant to do, for when she got home her uncle, Farmer Stonewer, knowed all about the matter, and told her how twas a very rooted opinion among the last generation that a miser's spirit never could leave its hidden hoard till the stuff was brought to light, and in human hands once more. Millions of good money has been found in that manner, if all we hear is true, declared Farmer Jimmy, and if one miser has been known to walk, which nobody can deny, then why shouldn't another? Them as believe in such dark things, and I don't say I do, and I don't say I don't, them as know of such mysteries happening in their own reflection or in the memory of their friends, would doubtless say that Miser Brimson still creeps around his gold now and again. And if that money be within the four corners of Dunnerbridge Farm, and if Jonathan happened to be on the lookout on the rightful night and at the rightful moment, "'Tis almost any odds, but he might see his forebear "'sitting over his money-bags like a hen on the clutch of eggs, "'and so recover the hoard. "'But faith's needed for such a deed, Mrs. Stonewer told her niece, "'and that pig-headed creature haven't no faith. "'Too proud he is to believe in anything he don't understand. "'Twas even so with Lucifer afore him. "'If you told him, Jonathan, this news, "'he'd rather let the money go "'than set off ghost-hunting in cold blood. "'Yet there it is.' and a humbler-minded fashion of chap, with a lord on his side, and a trustful heart in his bosom, might very like recover all them tubs of cash the miser came by. And then he'd have thousands to my poor tens, said Hyssop. Not that he'd ever come back to me now, I reckon. But all the same, she knowed by the look in Jonathan's eye, when they met, that he loved her still, and that his silly, proud heart was hungering after her yet, though he'd rather have been drawn under a harrow than show a spark of what was burning there. And so upon this nonsense about a buried treasure, 
she set to work again to use her brains and see if there might be any road out of the trouble by way of miser brimson's ghost what she did none but them as helped her ever knew until the story come drowned to me but was the cleverest thing that ever i heard of a maiden doing and it worked a wonder in fact i can't see but a single objection to the plot though that was a serious thing for the girl it lay in the fact that there had to be a secret between hyssop and her husband and she kept it close as the grave until the grave itself closed over him it was an innocent secret too and when all said tisn't a wedded pair in five hundred as haven't each their own one little cupboard fast locked with a key thrown away six months passed by and jonathan worked as only he knowed how to work and tried to forget his sad disappointment by dint of toil early and late he labored and got permission to reclaim a bit of moor for a new take and so added a very fair three acres to his farm he noticed about this time that his hind parsons did oft drag up the subject of mr brimson drake and first jonathan laughed and then he was angered and bade thomas hold his peace but though a very obedient and humble sort of man parsons would hark back to the subject and tell how his father had known a man who was own brother to a miser and how when the miser died his own brother had seen him clear as truth in the chimney corner of his room three nights after they'd buried him and how they made search and found not three feet from where the ghost had stood a place in the wall with seventeen golden sovereigns hid in it and a white witch's cure for glanders thomas parsons swore on the book to this and he said as a certain fact that new year's night was the time most misers walked and he advised jonathan not to be dead to his own interests at least as a thinking man that believes in religion and the powers of the air in bible word you might give it a chance said thomas and then jonathan told him to shut his mouth and not shame dunnerbridge by talking such childish nonsense the next autumn jonathan went up beyond exeter to buy some of the black-faced horned scotch sheep and he waited for parsons to go with him but his man falled ill the night afore and so young hacker went instead drake reckoned then that thomas parsons would have to leave for dunnerbridge weren't a place for sick folk and he made up his mind after he came back to turn the old chap off but thomas was better when the master got home so the question of sacking him was let be and jonathan contented himself by telling tom that if he falled ill again twould be the last time and parson said that was about as it should be but he hoped that at his age merely sixty-five or thereabouts he wouldn't be troubled with his breathing parts again for half a score years at least he added that he'd done his work as usual while the master was away but he didn't mention that hyssop burgess had made so bold as to call at dunnerbridge with a pony and cart and that she'd spent a tidy long time there and gone all over the house and farmyard among other places afore she drove off again and the next chapter of the story was told by jonathan himself to his two men on the first day of the following year there was but little light of morning just then and the three of them were putting down some bread and bacon and a quart of tea by candlelight in the dunnerbridge kitchen when thomas saw that his master weren't eating nothing to name instead he went out to the barrel and drawed himself a pint of ale and got along by the peat fire with it and stuck his boots so nigh the skies as dared without burning em what's amiss said thomas now don't say you am sick master if you be i lay no liquor smaller than brandy will fetch you round i bain't sick answered jonathan shortly he seemed in doubt whether to go on then he resolved to do so there was a man in the yard last night he said and if i thought as either of you chaps knowed anything about it i'd turn you off this instant afore you'd got the bacon out of your throats a man never cried parsons how was it the dog didn't bark asked hacker how the devil do i know why he didn't bark answered jonathan dark as night and staring in the fire one side of his face was red with the flames the other side blue as steel along of the daylight just beginning to filter in at the window all i can say is this he added i turned in at half after ten just after that brace of old fools to brownberry went off to see the new year in i slept till midnight then something woke me with a start what twas i can't tell but some loud sound near at hand no doubt i was going off again when i heard more row a steady sound repeated over and over 
and first I thought twas owls, then I heard twas not. You might have said twas somebody thumping on a barrel, but at any rate I woke up and sat up and found the noise was in the yard. I looked out of my chamber window then, and the moon was bright as day, and the stars sprinkling likewise, and there down by the old judge's table, where the thorn tree grows, I see a man standing by the old barrel, as plain as I see you chaps now. The judge's table be a wonderful curiosity at Donnerbridge, and if you go there, you'll do well to ax to see it. Tis a girt slab of moorstone said to have come from Crockentour, where the tinners held their parliament in the ancient times. Now it bides over a water trough with a white thorn tree rising up above. Jonathan took his breath when he'd got that far and fetched his pipe out of his pocket and lighted it. Then he drank off half the beer and spat in the fire and went on. A man so tall as me, if not taller, he got one of them old white beaver hats on his head, and he wore a flowing white beard so long as my plough horse's tail, and he walked up and down, up and down over the stones, like a sailor walks up and down on the deck of a ship. I shouted to the chap, but he didn't take no more notice than the moon. Up and down he went, and then I told him, if he wasn't off inside of two minutes, I'd get my fowling piece and let fly. Still he paid no heed. And I don't mind saying to you men that for half a second I felt creepy crawly and goose flesh down the back. But was only the cold, I reckon, for my window was wide open, and I'd been leaning out of it for a good while into ten degrees of frost. Now after that I got angry, and I went down house and hitched the gun off the hooks over the mantelpiece, and ran out just as I was, in naught but my boots and my nightshirt. The hour was so still as the grave at first, and the moon shone on the river far below and lit up the eaves and windows. And then through the silence I heard widecomb bells ringing in the new year. But the old night bird in his top hat was gone. Not a hair of his beard did he leave behind. I looked about, and then up came the dog barking like fury, not knowing who I was dressed that way, till he heard my voice. And that's the tale, and who be that curious old rascal I'd much like to know. They didn't answer at first, and the daylight gained on him. Then old Parson spoke up and wagged his head and swore twas no man his master had seen, but a creature from the other world. I'll lay my life, he said, twas the spectrum of Miser Brimson as you saw walking, and I'll take oath by the new year that twas his way to show where his stuff be buried. For God's sake, he says, if you don't want to get into trouble with unknown creatures, go out and pull up the cobblestones and see if there's anything underneath them. But Jonathan made as though the whole thing was nonsense, and wouldn't let neither Thomas nor Hacker move a pebble. Only the next day he went off to a very old chap called Samuel Windeat, whose father had been a boy at the time of the war prison, and was said to have seen and known Miser Brimson in the flesh. And the old man declared that in his childish days he'd heard of the miser, and that he certainly wore a beaver hat, and had a white beard a yard long. So Jonathan came home again more thoughtful than afore, and finally, though he declared that he was ashamed to do it, he let Tom over-persuade him, and two days after, the three men set to work where Drake had seen the spectrum. They dug and they dug, this way and that, and Jonathan found naught, and Parsons found naught. But Hacker came upon a box, and they dragged it out of the earth, and underneath of it was another box like the first. They was a pair of old rotten wood chests by the look of them, made of boards nailed together with rusty nails. No locks or keys they had. But that was no matter, for they fell abroad at a touch, and inside of them was a lot of plate, candlesticks, snuffers, tea kettles, table silver, and the like. Thunder! cried out Jonathan. Tis all pewter trash, not worth a five-pound note. Us'll dig again. And dig they did for a week till the farmyard in that place was turned over like a trenched kitchen garden, but not another teaspoon did they find. Meantime, however, somebody as understood such things explained to young Drake that the stuff on earth was not pewter, nor yet Britannia metal neither, but old Sheffield plate, and worth plenty of good money at that. Jonathan felt too mazed with the event to do anything about it for a month. Then he went to Plymouth and took a few pieces of the find in his bag, and the man what he showed him to was so terrible interested that nothing would do but he must come up to Dunnerbridge and see the lot. He offered two hundred and fifty pound for the things on the nail, so Jonathan saw very clear that they must be worth a good bit more. They haggled for a week, 
and finally the owner went up to Exeter and got another chap to name a price. In the long run, the dealers have the things, and Jonathan comes out with a clear three hundred and fifty-four pound. He wasn't very pleased to talk about his luck, and inquisitive people got but little out of him on the subject, but of course Parsons and Hackler spoke free and often on the subject, for it was the greatest adventure as had ever come to them in their lives, and from telling the tale over and over, old Parsons got to talk about it as if he'd seen the ghost himself. Then, after he'd chewed over the matter for a space of three or four months, and spring was come again, Jonathan Drake went off one night to White Works, just the same as he used to do when he was courting Hyssop Burgess. And there was the little party as usual, with Mrs. Stoneware knitting, and Farmer reading yesterday's newspaper, and Hyssop sewing in her place by her aunt. Well, says Farmer Jimmy, wonders never cease. And to see you again here be almost so big a wonder as that they tell about of the old miser's tea things. I'm sure we all give you joy, Jonathan, and I needn't tell you as we was cruel pleased to hear about it. The young man thanked them very civilly and said how twas a courier's come along of it, and he didn't hardly know what to think of the matter even to that day. I should reckon twas a bit of nonsense what I dreamed, he said, but money's money as who should know better than me. And by the same token, I want a few words with Hyssop, if she'm willing to give me ten minutes of her time. You'm welcome, Mr. Drake, she said. He started at the surname, but she got up, and they went off just in the usual way to the parlor, and when they was there, she sat down in her old corner of the horsehair sofa and looked at him. But he didn't sit down, not at first. He walked about fierce and talked fierce. I'll ask one question afore I go on, and if the answer's what I fear, I'll trouble you no more, he said. In a word, be you tokened again. I suppose you be, for you're not the sort to go begging. Say it quick, if tis so, and I'll be off and trouble you no further. No, Mr. Drake, I'm free as the day you, you throwed me over, she answered in a very quiet little voice. He snorted at that, but was too mighty thankful to quarrel with the words. She could see he began to grow terrible excited now, and he walked up and down, taking shorter and shorter strides this way and that, like a hungry caged tiger as knows his bit of horseflesh be on the way. At last he bursts out again. There was a lot of lies told about that old plate us found at Dunnerbridge, but the truth of the matter is that I sold it for three hundred and fifty-four pounds. So Tom Parsons told Uncle a wonderful thing, and we sat up all night talking about it, Mr. Drake. For God's sake, call me Jonathan, he cried out, and tell me. Tell me what the figure of your legacy was. You must tell me. You can't withhold it. Tis life or death to me. She'd never seen him so excited, but very well knowed what was in his mind. If you must know, you must, she answered. I thought I told you when, when. No, you didn't. I wouldn't bide to hear. Whatever twas, you got more than me, and that was all I cared about. But now, if by good fortune, tis less than mine, you understand. Of course tis less. A hundred and eighty pound and the interest, a little over two hundred in all, is what I've gotten. Thank God, he said. Then he asked her if she could marry him still, or if she knew too much about his ways and his ideas to care about doing so. And she took him again. You see, Hyssop Burgess was my mother, and when father died I had the rights of the story from her. By that time the old people at White Works and Tom Parsons was all gone home, and the secret remained safe enough with Hyssop herself. The great difficulty was to put half her money and more slap into Jonathan's hands without his knowing how it got there, and even when the game with the ghost was hit upon, it was hard to know how to do it clever. Hyssop wanted to hide golden sovereigns at Dunnerbridge, but her uncle, with a wonderful wit, pointed out that they'd all be dated, and to get three hundred sovereigns and more a hundred years old could never have been managed. Then old Thomas, who was in the secret, of course, and played the part of Miser Brimson, and got five pounds for doing it so clever, and another five after from his master when the stuff was found, he thought upon trinkums and jewels, and finally Mrs. Stonewer, as her friend in the business, said that Sheffield Plate would do the trick. And she was right. The plate was bought for three hundred and eighty pounds, and kept close at White Works, till it was known that Jonathan meant to go away and bide away some days. Then my mother drove across with it, 
and Thomas made the cases with old rotten boards, and they drove a slant hole under the cobbles, and got all vitty again long afore young Drake came back home. Me and Jonathan was wedded in the fall of that year, said my mother to me when she told the tale, and come the next New Year's night, he was at our chamber window as the clock struck twelve, and bided there looking out into the yard for an hour, keen as the hawk that he was. He thought I must be asleep, but well I knowed he was seeking for an old man in a beaver hat with a long white beard, and well I knowed he'd never see him again. Of course your father took care not to tell me the next morning that he'd been on the lookout for the ghost. And my mother, in her own last days, oft dwelt on that trick, and sometimes she'd say as the time for the meetin' father got nearer and nearer, I wonder if twill make any difference in heaven when no secrets be hid. And knowing my father so well as I had, I felt very sure as it might make a mighty lot of difference. So in my crafty way, I hedged and told mother that, for my part, I felt certain there were some secrets that wouldn't even be allowed to come out at Judgment Day, for fear of turning heaven into t'other place, and that this was one of them. She always used to fret at that, however. I want for it to come out, she'd say, and if Jonathan don't know, I shall certainly tell him. I've kept it in long enough, and I can't trust myself to do it no more. He's got to know, and with all eternity to get over it and forgive me, and I have a right to be hopeful that he will. His Drake died in that fixed resolve, and I'm sure I trust that when tis my turn to join my parents again, I shall find no shadow between em, but there's a lot of doubt about it, knowing father. End of chapter 16